Hi, I'm Fred Caston. Welcome to the 2021 Danny Barker Banjo and Guitar Festival, a mix of music and talk honoring the life, legacy, and music of one of the great New Orleanians of the 20th century, Danny Barker. My guests this hour are Grammy-winning vocalist and multi-instrumentalist Catherine Russell and artist manager, jazz historian, and a retired bluegrass ace, Paul Kahn. <laughs> <laughs> and ladies and gentlemen, please note, perfect social distancing, even though, as a matter of fact, Catherine and Paul are married. <laughs> we we uh, do our best. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's, it's a way of life, right? <laughs> it's, um, well, I haven't had a chance to talk with you two since uh, the great success in 2019 of uh, Alone Together, which... Um, finished the uh, year as Jazz Week's most played jazz CD in 2019, congratulations. But then in 2020, that um, sometimes uh, cruel uh, force and uh, unfortunate force known as fate uh, conspired to make that a, something of a worldwide anthem, alone, <laughs> yeah. together. Alone, yes. How did that feel? You know, uh... Uh, <laughs> it feels all kinds of ways, you know, and I, 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 I still want it to be a positive, uh, you know, have a positive spin, but boy, oh boy, when nobody had any idea. So what are you going to do? You know, yeah. it's been used a lot this year for different <laughs> things, you know, ads and different, uh, that phrase. So <laughs> I bet I played, played it at least 30 or 52 weeks on my show. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. Well, I had, I had to split a little time with uh, "Is you is or is you ain't my baby," yeah. <laughs> and uh, you know, then you needed to give some some coverage to "You can't pull the wool over my eye," <laughs> or can <Yes>. you? <laughs> yeah, or can you? Yeah, all yeah. all of the above. Right, right. Uh, <laughs> But uh, that's a great, great record. Another, and, and that's what your seventh, I think, is uh, my seventh. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. Beautiful, beautifully done, Catherine. Uh, Thank you. As 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 usual. Uh, since then, have you had a chance uh, in 2020 to to actually do much performing? Well, uh, the performing, I've got to say, I'm grateful for every opportunity that I've had in 2020, and um, I've done a bunch of uh, audienceless, uh, performances, you know, uh, for, you know, jazz at Lincoln center. We did the big band holidays. We did a 92nd street Y Billy holiday tribute. Um, and then other, uh, things where I sent videos in to people and, you know, I uh, turned my, my, my room here into my, uh, home studio my closet is my control room you know this type of thing and um but but yeah but people you know have found i'm trying to find my list here people have found a lot of ways to um to work so there have been a lot of recording sessions you know not only at home but uh in the actual studios recording studios have been quite busy i'm happy to say and so people said, well, you know, I'm not performing live. Let me, let me record something. So that's been good. You know, that's been very good. Have and, you, oh, excuse me, I, I was going to say, ask, have you been working on a, a new record for yourself? Well, in the, uh, in the last world, you know, in the first three months of this year, um, my band was working. So I had an opportunity to perform most of what I was choosing going to choose to put on the next album. So at least we, we, we got it out there in front of people and aired it. And now I am just working on the rest of what I'm going to pick. So, you know, I like to pick 13 or 14 tunes. Oh, they don't all make it, you know? Right. So, uh, so I'm almost there. So I am definitely aiming to get back in the studio in the next couple of months. Well, one of the things that you had done before that did come out was uh, a great take on uh, Alberta Hunter. Thank you. I love Alberta Hunter. So she's always one of my go-to um, artists for material. And uh, I had the you know, honor and privilege of seeing her perform when she was at the cookery uh, in New York City when I was uh, a young woman. 
and she greatly influenced me as far as uh, her performing style and the material that she chose, you know, her jazz and blues mix and the way she handled an audience, you know, so. And this uh, tune that you're referring to uh, is one of her original tunes. And it's just a great, well-written tune for all time. You know, you can apply it to anything pretty much. And that is, you got to reap just what you sow. Just what you sow. And uh, this was, we did this um, for my second album, which was recorded at Levon Helm Studios in Woodstock, New York, produced by the great Larry Campbell, multi-instrumentalist producer, uh, writer, plays anything with strings and sings, beautiful harmony. And, um, and the great Howard Johnson, multi-instrumentalist, and so Howard plays some great tuba on it and Larry plays guitar and I had the privilege of playing a little rhythm mandolin on the track. And giving a, a great vocal reading too. Yeah. It's, Thank it's, you. It, it's the bluegrass side of Catherine Russell. <laughs> <laughs> I was proud to hear it myself. I like everything. So, you know, whatever, you know, whatever I have fun singing is, is uh, what I like. And, yeah, and, uh, go ahead, Paul. Sorry. Yeah, if I could just interject two things. The um, All of the uh, income, it's a digital only single, but all of the income from anyone who streams or downloads the single, it, we're donating to the Jazz Foundation of America's COVID-19 relief fund. fund. So yeah. it's the, whatever income comes from that single will we'll go to, to musicians in need during this uh, pandemic. And the other, the other thing I wanted to mention, since you had asked about material for the next album, and this is a good segue into Danny Barker, is that uh, one of the virtual concerts that Catherine gave this past October 1st was live from Dizzy's Club at Jazz at Lincoln Center. And that concert ended up getting broadcast on New Year's Eve on NPR stations across the country. They have a, an annual Toast of the Nation jazz party, and it's an hour long set. And within that set, Catherine mentioned she picks tunes that she's going to record and does them in her gigs. And she had done this in, back in February at Birdland. The song is called Sticks and Stones. Oh, yeah. and, it was, and, and it was inspired from a Henry Red Allen recording from 1937, Seven. which th that the recording actually uh, has Danny Barker on guitar Lewis Russell on piano and Henry Red Allen is the leader on, on this. And Catherine had picked out this tune and it was on our, the list of, you know, to be recorded. And she actually, you know, performs it on this New Year's Eve broadcast, which you can actually stream now. If you go to Toast of the Nation NPR, you can listen to the whole hour. Um, and uh, yeah, she, she performs it as a, a, a trio with, uh, with Matt Munisteri on guitar and Tal Ronan on bass. It's a real fun tune. It is, and uh, brings in into our discussion uh, yet another character, Paul Barberin, who who plays on that and yes. uh, is a strong connection between Danny Barker and Catherine's dad, Lewis Russell. Uh, an extremely deep and 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 long-standing connection. Paul Barberin was Danny Barker's uncle, um, and you know came from a. Uh, you know, a very, uh, you know, renowned musical family in New Orleans. Um, and um, he, uh, of the three of, you know, Barberin, Lewis Russell and Danny Parker, Paul Barberin is the elder. He was, he was born in uh, 1899, I believe. And, and uh, so he was like, you know, nine or 10 years older than, uh, than Danny Barker. And he was one or two years older than Lewis Russell. And so he was kind of the, really the, the linchpin to this whole kind of family connection because uh, there, there are two really important connections that Paul Barberin had with Lewis Russell. One was that he was the drummer in Lewis Russell's orchestras for 16 years uh, of, of recording and, and, and performing, starting in New Orleans in 1922 at, at a club called Tom Anderson's Cabaret. And from there, um, th th four of the members of that group 
um, went to Chicago to work with King Oliver. And from there, and, and the members were Paul Barberin, Albert Nicholas, uh, Barney Begard, and Lewis Russell. They were in, in this band in New Orleans right after Lewis Russell arrived there. They went to Chicago, joined King Oliver, and worked with him for a few years until they all together went to New York City. And, you know, so following that, Lewis Russell was leading his own recording orchestra in New York City. And um, Paul Barbin was kind of like, in addition to the drummer, he was like the informant guy who, when they needed, you know, someone to, you know, play trumpet when King Oliver's chops were kind of falling apart because he had he had a gum disease. Paul Barber said, hey, let's get Henry Red Allen from New Orleans and, and bring him up here. And so he brought Henry Red Allen into the mix. And, you know, he was j just a, you know, a real important component, you know, in terms of the, the Lewis Russell Orchestra. So I'm rambling on and on, but. Well, well no, it's, I. I Go ahead. I think it's interesting that that you know Lewis Russell arrived in New Orleans in 1921, and then by 1922, he had hooked up, you know, with Paul Barber and everybody else. Well, he, what I love the story of how he got there, uh, Catherine. Uh, how Lewis, your dad, got to New Orleans in the first place. Yeah, well, he was, uh, and Paul will correct me if I get any of these these facts wrong, but <laughs> he was a. Uh, uh, a piano player for silent films uh, in Panama. And then won a lottery, Panamanian National Lottery for $3,000. And uh, his mother, he and his mother and his sister came over and went to New Orleans. His mother had been in the United States before that. So it wasn't her first time. She had studied in the States. And, and uh, but that enabled them to get on the boat and a uh, big boat and, uh, and come to New Orleans. And then uh, my dad, of course, seemed like, you know, he wanted to, he had an idea to go to New Orleans anyway, like a lot of other people, because there was work there, you know, because so many musicians were coming in. And um, so he immediately just started to try to, to make connections and form bands and get gigs, and he did. Paul, have, have you been able to determine when uh, Paul uh, Barbara and, and Lewis Russell first got together as composers? Well, it was very early on because um, uh, Lewis Russell filed copyrights with the Library of Congress from Chicago in 1925 and 1926. And he, he there were probably more that he filed, but I someone had had emailed me like a printout of like ten of, of the copyrights, and it's interesting because of those ten, uh, five of them are co-rights with Paul Barberin, five of them are, are just Lewis Russell, and 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 of the five that he co-wrote with Paul Barberin, two of them ended up getting recorded, and three of them are just you know among their catalog of lost compositions that were never recorded and we don't know what they sound like but um one of those uh, come back sweet papa was recorded by lewis armstrong and the hot fives and and that was in uh, 1926 and it was armstrong's second recording session with the hot fives they went in on one day just recorded one tune and that was the tune and this was before uh, either Paul Barberin or Lewis Russell recorded with King Oliver, which happened the next month. So in fact, their very first um, appearance on recording was as a songwriting team. And so they were really, I mean, Paul Barberin was a composer with other people besides Lewis Russell, but the, the, I, I would say that in that, in that little band of Tom Anderson, there was kind of a, a click kind of thing and Begard, Barney Begard and Albert Nicholas, they were hanging out as pals because they had the, the two saxophone thing going right. and they were kind of like inventing that. And, you know, the uh, musicians were coming off the river boats, coming to check them out and see what they were doing because it was something new. And, and then, you know, the rhythm section 
guys, uh, Lewis Russell piano and Paul Barberman drums, they, they kind of hung out as, as, a, as a unit. And then when they all ended up in Chicago together, the, you know, the, the Barber and Russell thing kind of deepened because of the songwriting. But they also were just a great rhythm section. And I would, right. <laughs> I, I would just say that, you know, I'm thinking over this, this huge body of recorded work that they did together and say to the listeners for Danny Barker Festival people, if they want to check out like one of the hardest swinging uh, rhythm sections in, in the history of jazz, listen to King Oliver and the Dixie Syncopators recordings from 1926 and 27. Then listen to Lewis Russell orchestra recordings in New York City in 1929 and 1930. And then beyond that, Henry Red Allen recordings in New York City in 1929 and 1930, and Louis Armstrong recordings in New York City in 1929. There's a whole, basically the band was used by different leaders. They had their own recordings right. and, 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 and it's just like an incredible body of work. And then the, the sort of the, the, the cherry on, the, on top of the Sunday is Louis Armstrong orchestra in the swing era from 1935 to 1938 the Decca recordings. It's all Paul Barberin and, and Lewis Russell and Pops Foster. So together they formed the, really the hardest swinging rhythm section in, in, in that period. And, you know, a lot of uh, writers have talked about, you know, the, the com competitive scene in New York and who, who was the best band. And, you know, Russell got rated up there with, with Duke Ellington and Fletcher Henderson in, in a lot of histories. But everyone kind of agreed on one thing is that some bands did certain things maybe better than the Lewis Russell Orchestra, but nobody swung harder than they did. Uh, everything uh, that I've heard just hops off, you know, the record player. I mean, it really does. It, yeah. <laughs> it, it makes you, you, if you're not moving, you better get, check your pulse, man. <laughs> it, it's, it's true. They, they really could outswing anyone else. And um, I think that, you know, people really praised Paul Barber in, as a drummer. Every, everyone that worked with him, Louis Armstrong, Albert Nicholas, Louis Russell, they all are on the record of saying, you know, he, he was really a great drummer who, un, he could play a lot of different styles, but, you know, the, uh, the comment that I think Albert Nicholas made, um, he was asked in an interview, what was the, 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 you know, the special thing about the Louis Russell Orchestra and he just simply answered, he said, we all spoke the same language. Oh, yeah. What a beautiful yeah. thing. <laughs> yeah. Beautiful thought there. And, and uh, you know, they had a, um, the real Lewis Russell Orchestra also uh, with the tunes that, uh, one of the tunes that Paul, I think, and, and, and Lewis co-wrote had a kind of a modern sound to me, and that's the new call of the freaks. I love their titles anyway. <laughs> They got some great titles, man, but uh, that one had a, a very modern feel, kind of open harmony sound and an interesting feel. Yeah, that's a, um, a classic. It's a cult uh, classic, and it's also pr probably uh, Lewis Russell's uh, biggest hit. It was a, a big record in 1929 and, and also kind of his theme song, and he re-recorded it in different uh, titles and iterations that, you know, there were, he, there were the ghost of the freaks and there were, there was freakish blues and uh, yeah. then garbage can blues and his band yeah, right. in the later forties. And they were all, you know, Barbara and Russell uh, co co-writes. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, people have compared that um, the new call of the freaks to, to like an Ellington sounding yeah. modern um, it's kind of a modal blues and it, it has um one of the, one invention in recording history is that maybe the first recording that ha that had a fade at the end where right now you think you're going to make a record how do we end it there are a million ways you can hit, you know the drummer can hit hit the the uh, the, the, the symbols and and right. end it that way but they they ended the song by there were no faders there it was there wasn't like a recording studio where the engineer could just pull down a lever everybody just start, started playing softer and softer and, 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 and they kind of invented that with that particular recording. I remember Alan Toussaint talking about 
how he said, well, we were so out of it. We were, uh, the, you know, technology, we didn't want the engineer to turn fade it down. We just wanted to play the fade. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so he was, he was, uh, he was saying that Cosimo got him kind of squared away on letting the engineer do some of it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so even after they had that, uh, technique, uh, technically possible, uh, it wasn't always, always the case. Um, well, uh, Paul Barberin also uh, was very instrumental. In fact, he, speaking of instruments, I think he sent Danny Barker his first banjo. And uh, then he, yeah. he, he helped, uh, actually, he's the one who arranged for Danny to come up to New York in, in 1930. Yeah. Um, I guess that uh, when Danny came to New York, he, he actually lived with Paul Barberin and, and Paul's wife and and Henry Red Allen and, and, and Red's wife. So they were all living together. And I mean, that, you know, what an incredible time in terms of what was going on. And, you know, that it was the beginning of like the collapse of what had been the most incredible decade, you know, in October of 29, the stock market crashes and things start to change, you know, depression starts setting in. But I think, you know, 1929 and 30 were were just like really exciting uh period in terms of recording and and gigs and everything that was going on in 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 uh in new york city and harlem and and everywhere else and by the time uh danny barker gets to new york uh paul and and lewis had uh almost a decade under their belts of, of working together as, as uh, players and composers yeah, that's, that's true. And, um, it's, it's really, um, you know, interesting because like Barbara and Paul Barbara was, he was a mentor and, and an informant, like I said before, he, he kind of like made connections for people. And, um, I think in a sense that like Lewis Russell and Paul Barbara were very business oriented, you know, the, mm. they, they both knew that, you know, they were, they were interested in, in, you know, long money and, and mailbox money. They wanted to, you know, they wanted to get their name on songs and get them covered. So I think part of the idea is like they were in Chicago and they're filing these, these copyrights. And th amazingly, they got Louis Armstrong to record one of their songs. I mean, there isn't even a drum on, on that track. I mean, right, right. <laughs> but, but still, yeah. I mean, so the other interesting thing is that um, since we're on that subject, in um, Lewis Russell's, uh, you know, archive, we found a letter that Paul Barbarin wrote in 1960. Uh, One, 1961, 1961, I think. 1961, and um, he wrote a letter to Lewis Russell. And now they hadn't really been working together um, since 1938. And all these years later, um, and, and Lewis Russell saved this letter and. Catherine, would you like to, to, to read it? I mean, it's, sure. it's really. I have it right here. And this the, is, the, uh, I'll just set it up and then you can read it. But the gist, yeah. of the, the gist of the letter is that Paul Barberin is writing to Lewis Russell saying, you know, I haven't gotten the royalties that, that, that I should be getting and probably neither of you for Come Back Sweet Papa because everybody in the world has, has covered that tune. You know, the Hot Fives, was, you know, was the collectors, you know, the, the holy grail of early jazz and right. bands all over the world had been recording it. And he was like, where's our money? So Catherine can. Uh... Yeah, so this is uh, comes from Paul Barberin from New Orleans, September 7th, 1961. Hi, Fess. So Fess was short for professor. Right. So they call him my dad, Fess. I know you will be surprised to hear from me. Well, I've been putting off for a long time. So here it is. Hope you and family are enjoying the best. My wife and I are well. Thank God for that. Now, Fess, it's a lot of loot we've never gotten. And Leeds, and so Leeds, Paul, you can... Uh, yep. uh, uh, Leeds probably had the, was the publisher of Come Back, Sweet Papa. Okay. Right. Yeah. And Leeds is not fair, I'm sure, to us. That is why I offered Harrison Smith 25% on every dollar he gets from me because he knows the score. That is the most money I ever got on Come Back Sweet Papa. And there's a lot more to get. 
every record collector in the world has a record of the tune. It is just about 30 companies selling our tune and Leeds won't do anything about it. Well, I tell you the truth. I'd rather have something than have nothing coming in. I'm supposed to join Papa Bue's band for three weeks concert over in Copenhagen sometime in the future. I will find out all I can if I go there. Papa View recorded Come Back Sweet Papa, and it was a big seller I heard. Bob Crosby's band and many other bands. I hope you go down to Leeds' office and let them know what is happening. I have a contract with Leeds on Sweet Papa, or if you don't get results, have a good talk with Harrison Smith. It is a shame the way some publishers does, the way some publisher does. Well, Fess, if I come to New York this year, I will look you up. My best to you, PB. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. And then, and then in, included in, in uh, that, that was a cover letter, it was a package with royalty statements. And he includes a royalty statement, which from Leeds Music for the period ending See. December 31, 1960, for, for 22 cents. <laughs> and uh, that's like streaming income, man. The statement is, you know, you, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, you, you received 22 cents then, and then stamped, stamped on a statement. It says, this amount is due you, but since it is not our custom to pay royalties on totals of less than $1, we are holding this amount credited to you until the next royalty period. Yeah, and meanwhile, you can so, hold, your, hold your breath and hold your stomach, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, man. But, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because, you know, I think he was on to something, you know, like, these musicians, you know, kept in touch with each other. And not that long before this time, Barney Begard was in Los Angeles and, and Kid Ori, they were, they were both living in Los Angeles and they went crawfishing one day. And um, so, you know, Barney, you know, says to, to Ori, he said, you know, so um, how much have you made on that uh, Muskrat Ramble tune? And and Ori says to the Begard, I haven't, I haven't never, you know, earned a penny from that tune. So uh, Barney Begard is shocked, you know. So he, he said, look, I, I know a guy in Los Angeles. Let's go to his office tomorrow. So he, they, they, there's a publishing guy in L.A. that Barney Begard knows. They go in there. And uh, they look up the tune. We, we didn't know how to reach you. I mean, uh, there's a lot of money here. And that turned into like a big payday for Kid Ori. And that tune, Muskrat Ramble, was from the same period as Come Back Sweet Papa. Um, so maybe Barbara was, was thinking, you know, maybe, maybe the, there's a windfall there for us that we're, that we're miss, missing out on. But I think one difference is that collecting royalties from collector record labels, you know, right. is, not, is not, it, not as easy as like Muskrat Ramble had some kind of crossover big uh uses right yeah in the publishing you know jargon that led to you know i think kid i got like six thousand was making you know monthly amounts after that so well yeah some something a little bit similar happened with the barkers danny and blue lou uh courtesy of don't you feel my leg oh yeah mm -hmm. uh, thanks to i think dr john and maria moldar but right. Maria Moldauer, yeah. So did they end up tracking down there? And they, they were uh, able to I think they did. Later. They got a pretty good uh, pretty good chunk of change, I think, or certainly to recoup. Know, yeah. Uh, that had uh, been mis never given or may I don't even know if I'm not sure of the circumstances of it, but they were able to collect, thankfully. And yeah. then from the and like with his uh, experience, then continued to receive the um, as that as that her record sold and i assume that um when she did her uh, most recent recording maybe the estate gets gets some uh, yes for, for, from that i had the privilege of hearing uh, catherine uh do some of that blue blue barker material with a great new orleans band in new york city <laughs> a while back and man was that a great show <laughs> That was so much fun. And, you know, that leads to just how the, you know, you, we think about how the New Orleans tradition um, just, just, just affects everything, you know, in the jazz world and the mentorship aspect 
of, of that was so important for me working with Dr. Michael White and Pearl and Riley, who I knew before, but not hadn't worked with them in this context with the New Orleans guys, you know, and mm -hmm. Shannon Powell. And they just mentored me right through that uh, Blue Loose stuff, you know, I, I, because uh, Dr. Dr. Michael White picked, he sent me some tunes and then he picked the ones uh, that he wanted me to do. And there, there was one, a uh, little girl from, and I have it written down here, and I had to, you know, I just, I, I listened to the tune and I thought, oh my goodness, is he going to ask me a uh, girl from Jacksonville? <laughs> little girl so from Jacksonville. Danny oh, yeah. Parker, <laughs> yeah, uh, had, when he was in New York, he, a lot of kids play on the street, you know, so little girls always have these nursery and all these things that we used to do. And so he heard uh, girls on the street playing and it was kind of this nursery rhyme type of thing. You know, little girl from Jacksonville, Jacksonville. And then there are dances that go to all these things, all these places. And so Dr. White said, well, why don't you sing that tune? You know? And I thought, I don't know these dances, but I'm gonna have to look them up. So that's what I did. I researched them and then did the best I could and put these things together. And it was so, it turned out to be so much fun. And then they taught me, they said, here, you do this. Here's how you do the second line here. Where's your kerchief? You know, so we did. <laughs> so those guys were so great. And they had all been mentored by Danny Barker as well. So the mentoring continues, you know, continues on. And, uh, you know, so that's really how, what ties all of this together for me, you know, and I'm just so glad that my dad was, uh, came up with, with these elders and also so was able to be mentored, you know, and brought into different things by Paul Barber and, and, and just, just be, you know, and he, and he was just ambitious enough to work his way in there to the, cause that's a, like a tight knit, uh, community. So it's right. really it's astonishing to me, you know, the more I read that Lewis Russell was able to really get in there with these guys at that time. Yeah, quite, quite an accomplishment. And boy, what a, uh, I'm looking here at this uh, 11 piece uh, photo of, of the uh, Lewis Russell Orchestra, 11 pieces and uh, six maybe all time greats and everybody in, in it is is a wonderful player. I mean, it's an amazing band so strong just strong everybody you know it's like an all-star band yeah uh, from from rhythm section on, on up to the uh very top there like mr lewis armstrong playing that <laughs> you know you got you got red allen you know uh, as the under so they call him the understudy Study. <laughs> right. Armstrong. right and that's and a pretty red good allen. barometer right there yeah. yeah oh my god i mean just you listen to red allen's playing and and he was just like he was in a class by himself, but there was only one Louis Armstrong, but right. I mean, he, and you know, JC Higginbotham on trombone, Charlie Holmes on saxophone, Albert Nicholas on clarinet. They had amazing, all yeah. great soloists. And uh, so, yeah. You know, I, I, we talked about the call of the freaks earlier. I really like the little, it's a little short, but vocal trio in there. It's, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's just uh, stand, stood out to me, you know, it, it just uh, fit perfectly. They, they made it come alive with that. Yeah. Yeah. So that was, uh, who's the Walt, Walter Pichon? Am I saying that right? Pichon? Pichon? Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, Lewis Metcalf and... Uh, I think it was Higginbotham, Red Allen. Higginbotham? And, and Metcalf. Yeah, I think they... Red Allen and Metcalf. Yeah. I think okay. that, yeah, they brought, uh, yeah. you know, Metcalf, when Red Allen joined the band, Louis Metcalf was, you know, playing the first trumpet, and he was like, "Oh, this guy plays too much for me. I, I, I it's time for me to leave." <laughs> and uh, so he left. But they, they, you know, brought him back in just to do that vocal trio. And you know, the content of it is is also worth mentioning because, in a, in an era of uh, double entendre blues lyrics, you know, stick out the can. Here yeah, comes the garbage, garbage man. man. <laughs> They stood up. All, they stayed up all night writing that one. By <laughs> you know, yeah. I used to when I was little because "New Call of the Freaks" was probably one of the first songs I heard. 
in my life by my dad and I was three or something like that. <laughs> and I was just picturing, I didn't understand stick out your can, of course, at that age. So I was thinking, oh, it's take the garbage out. You know, oh. <laughs> and then later on, I was like, oh, no. <laughs> Ah, jeez. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> naughty boys. Okay, yeah, naughty yeah, boys. Yeah. <laughs> well, in, in that uh, me or you, then, uh, which Danny Barker came into in, in 1930 in New York, it was just a wonderfully creative community. Uh, uh, amazingly so. Absolutely. So, I mean, you know, did, and, and so you're saying that uh, Paul Barber just, you know, said, here, I got a banjo, come on up come on up to New York, you know? Yeah, he had, he had sent him, I think his first one many years ago. And then, um, you know, later said, now's the time in 1930. Danny and Blue were just married. So I guess right. he figured it was a good time for him to make, maybe, you know, pick up a few pieces of furniture and move. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if they had any. And then, and then uh, you know, Danny went on to uh, be, be the regular guitar player for for years with Cab Calloway's right. you know big swing band the big orchestra and uh, interestingly there's one photo where Cab Calloway Paul Barberin Danny Barker and Lewis Russell are all together in addition to Red Allen and J C Higginbotham and a, a a dancer named Peg Leg Bates oh yeah and um, it's a great photo it, it's a really great photo um, I think it was taken soon after. Danny Barker arrived in New York because there was there was a some reporting that you know Cab Calloway actually took Lewis Russell's orchestra out on the road for ten weeks hmm. at one point in the early '30s and fronted them and they you know the Cotton Club you know had a rotating uh, you know Duke Ellington was the, was the first and main band in, in the Cotton Club and then you know Cab Calloway was there and Irving Mills managed both of them and it, he he set up another band called the Mills Blue Rhythm Band. So there'd always be like a good orchestra that he controlled playing the Cotton Club. And when, when one would, would come in, another might go out on the road. And I think it was in that case that Cab Calloway took Lewis Russell's band out and on a little tour. And that may have been when that photo was taken. Um, they all look pretty young. They 19, do. 1932, I think, is one thing I read. I got to see Peg Leg Bates dance one time with the Harlem Globetrotters. Wow. Nice. <laughs> he, he, yeah, he was, he was actually, uh, a lot of people have commented to me about how they knew him. And I guess he, he had some kind of thing going on in upstate New York in the Catskills hmm. long after this era and, and was a, a, a real uh, kind of celebrity in his own right. Hell of a dancer, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> one That's one great. leg one leg rhythm you couldn't believe <laughs> <laughs> wow uh well uh i think we're just about exhausted our time here this afternoon uh, oh. but uh, um, it is um it always comes too soon yeah you yeah. know I, I would just like to um thank you fred for inviting us to be part of this but also for the work that you do in kind of preserving and uh, the history and um, bringing it to people in schools and, and, you know, furthering the education and the historical um, exploration of this incredible, you know, deep and rich legacy. And, uh, you know, you, you're an inspiration uh, Thank you. to us in, in your work. And Danny Barker was an inspiration to us too, because he was a historian. Oh, that was that was a big part of, of, of what he, yes. you know, and, and Lewis Russell, they, they wanted to, you know, kind of document and preserve the legacy. I think they both had the long view you know, <laughs> yes. of, of what uh, they could do, what how meaningful what they were doing and what their colleagues were doing is, was and will be. And, uh, and they were not afraid to yeah. take chances and That's take right. steps. So this is this is what I uh take from that, you know, the, the more I read about Danny Barker and his life, and he was so uh, great at writing about his life as well. It's just, you know, okay, I, you, he, you know, the guy, he's got a banjo and the guy says, hey, I got a gig over here. And he's got to ask his mom, you know, the guy wants to take him to Mississippi. Right. And, he, 
and he's and he's got to ask his mother. And his mother's like, "Don't don't go to Mississippi, Mississippi man. <laughs> don't go to Mississippi." <laughs> and he know? found out why she had said that. <laughs> you know, and then you learn all about that and the people there, yeah. and all about the culture. Yeah, so, a life a life in jazz is a great read, and I'd say a must for any jazz fan. It's it really is, and it really gives gives one insight into how people lived. Yeah. And, you know, so by keeping Danny Barker's name alive, uh, Fred, I mean, it, 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 it's what a rich history. Uh, and, it, and it's just endless. It's just it just gives me hope, you know, all the time. The more I the more I delve into the history. Yeah. You, you find uh, that some of the greater influencers of our lives and our times ultimately are not people you maybe have known the most about. But uh, you find out in the long run, they really set, an, set a, uh, an agenda and a way of living that has paid dividends for the rest of society. Absolutely. Well, gentlemen and lady, thank yeah. you very much for joining us. <laughs> Until we meet again in person, what a pleasure to have seen you here via the old Zoomer. Oh, absolutely. Thank you thank for you having again. us. <laughs> thank you all. We're and, gonna, and we're gonna see you next year at the Danny Barker Festival. We're gonna see you. Okay, you, you have a, a ironclad deal there, my <laughs> right. Don't let anybody say otherwise. That's it. Okay. All right. Yes. Go around cheating people by some trickery or plan. You can't tell lies on your neighbor. Thinking no one will ever know. But as sure as you are living, you've got to reap just what you sow. You've got.